Anyway, um, I should mention, just to, as a part of understanding where I'm coming from in this whole deal, uh, when Dr. Brooks invited me to, to Jacksonville, uh, and the fact that I have a serious interest in, in justice and the correct execution of the law, uh, and I made some contacts and friends that were disgruntled with the system. Uh, the Latners, for instance, the daughter, the, the, the Karen's niece, Melissa, had been murdered in Jacksonville. The murderer went around town bragging that he had done the murder. And the police would not investigate. And the reason was because this guy had been convicted of drugs. And then what they'd done is they turned him so that he would rat out on other people. So he was their informant. And the last thing they wanted to do was for him to be gone forever to prison on a murder charge. And so they didn't do anything about it. And Karen had all kinds of evidence, and nobody would lift a finger. And um, that was just one example of, of a bunch of them. Anyway, uh, the, uh, you know, I was there just, you know, humbly doing my thing and uh, helping people across the country. And uh, then, The day came when uh, we became aware of a church building a few blocks away, up for sale. Made a deal with the church directors and said, okay, I'm gonna put down cash, down payment for our church group. And, uh, and then to pay the balance off in cash uh, six months from now. And this was in the fall of 2007. And the real estate closing was April 30th, 2008. And uh, this building was like over, with, it's like around 35,000 square feet with 30,000 plus usable space. And on two and a half acres downtown Jacksonville. And um, I put in everything I had and, uh, and there were also other people put in work. Uh, managed to make it on the day of the closing with 45 minutes to spare after half a year. <laughs> Finally came up with the last bit. And, and uh, then immediately two weeks later began three SWAT attacks. Most people can't handle one. And there were three SWAT attacks in less than a month. I mean, we're talking smashing the, you know, those big expensive glass doors to smithereens, you know, damaging the aluminum frames and everything, and uh, just terrible, you know. And they come charging in with their full riot gear and their machine guns and shotguns and everything else, and. Uh, The second time they did that, I believe they came to kill me. And I have good reason to believe that because the building, um, so the building looks like this, and Dr. Brooks's dental clinic is here, and then there's an entry here and an entry here, and my office is over here. And they break in at this end of the building, for the first time, the first time they broke in here, went all their way up to where I am. So they actually are in my bedroom, in my office. They see the layout of the place and everything. They, they're there. And they come, that was May 15th, 2008. When they came back on May 22nd, instead of coming in this door, because they know I'm here, no, they come in the middle of the building over here.
year. And they'd shut the power off in that whole section. So it's in the dark. And what happens in the dark? Accidents like we thought Fox was reaching for a gun. And so we shot him 40 rounds in the back. You know what I mean? And, uh, uh, but anyway, they come charging in. They, 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 they smashed his door to the smithereens. And before they did it, they had a news media lined up on the street, okay? And, and I called that stuff into question, too, because it's not reporting the news, because the news happens and then they report it, right? But these people were integrally, they were integrated into the thing. So they were, they were there with their cameras rolling before anything happened. So, you know, the, the police use the battering ram. Well, they're there putting that on television, you know? And, uh, and so, um, and the propaganda was not just, not just in that county, not just the state of Texas, not just nationally, it went international, okay? And people telling me in Canada that they watched the stuff on television. Anyway, um, they come charging in first thing in the morning and they come into my section of the building. I'm, at, I'm in the office, I'm at the computer, and with me is Judy Scott, 70 years old, recovered from six bypass heart surgery, worked for worked under two sheriffs, and was licensed to do so before she retired. Could you have a better witness? <laughs> and they were like in a state of shock, you know, because there she was. And they stuck the machine guns in her face handcuffed her so tight that she had scars and and she was begging for her heart medication which they wouldn't let her have you know they could have killed the poor woman and uh, so this is the way they are and you know hopefully with the rest of the stuff that we cover this weekend you'll be more prepared or armed so that you won't be defenseless if any of this kind of crap happens to you. That's my objective. Does that make sense? Because <coughs> it was a horrendous experience. As a matter of fact, with the three SWAT attacks, they stacked charges on me to where I was looking at multiple lifetimes in prison. And with nine charges and over three years of litigation, they got zero victories. Now, most people don't survive a single attack. You know what I mean? The statistics in Texas in particular, apparently the FBI did this a check on the statistics, and Texas wins 99.6% of the cases. That leaves 0 0.04 for all the rest of us. How sweet is that? Just 0.4. Huh? Just 0.4. Yeah, 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 pardon me. It's 0%, 0 0.4. Well, zero for us because you win the other point four. <laughs> yeah. So, so zero point four percent. So about Dr. Brooks? What happened with Dr. Brooks? Oh, thank you. I, I get, sometimes I need a reminder. Okay, so what happened to Dr. Brooks? Yes. So I did up the amicus curiae. Uh, like I say, the woman gave me the report the day he was jailed. I did it to Mika's Curiae the next day, and I got it to the, the court and got it file stamped in. And the file stamp said 502. Okay, most people don't know what that means. 
they closed at five. <laughs> so, so what happened is the security had tried to keep me out and I managed to get in and get it to the clerk and it was file stamped even though I was late and, and like that. Anyway, a couple of business days he was popped right out because they can't make it work when they're, you know, assuming facts not in evidence and uh, with what they were doing. And an, an additional piece on that whole deal is that the document, the amicus curiae, was pretty ferocious, as you can understand. And I'll, I'll have a copy for you all on, on that, too. It was pretty ferocious. The net effect was they've never let me in that courthouse again. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, Okay. I got a comment, and the comment is, I think that you mentioned Middle Temple Bar, and I think if you, nobody, they don't want you to know about the Middle Temple Bar, they don't care if you know it, but they don't want the world to know it. And if you explain where that comes from, I can explain it, but I'd rather hear it from you. Okay. Well. All these attorneys are with the Bar Association, and so uh, you'll have the Phoenix Bar so under the Arizona Bar, it's under the American Bar, which all comes from the Middle Temple of the Crown, Inns of Court, London, England. They control worldwide. Okay? So. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's, by the yeah, there's the Jesuits are involved and um, Everything. Queen Elizabeth and all of that stuff. I mean, people here uh, wave the flag and have fireworks for July the 4th, but uh, are apparently unaware that the Queen is still running the thing. George Bush was her cousin, is her cousin. One, one, one more comment, and I'll sit down and show it. Uh, the, most people believe that the crown of England is the king and queen. But the king and queen and the crown of England, the royal family, are as diverse as my fingers right now. The crown, the crown of England is a one-mile square area called the city in London. It's exactly like the... Uh, Washington, D.C. Right. In fact, Washington, D.C. was patterned after it. And the crown of England runs the world. And you have to go do a little more study, I can tell you, but I don't want to give it more. If you want me to tell it, I'll tell it. Well, I'll, I'll try and cover that here right now, real quick. People have heard the phrase, sun never sets on the British Empire. Right. And they're global, okay? That's why the sun never sets on the British Empire. But it's in the Bible. And the, the verse in the Bible, I forget exactly where it is, but it's, the scepter shall not depart the hand of Judah to the second coming of Shiloh. The scepter is rulership over the planet. Is that in the book of David? Uh, Genesis 49. <laughs> Somebody's real sharp here. <clears throat> so, so anyway, uh, it's it's a part of our Heavenly Father's sense of humor from my perspective because if it was a giant like Russia this vast country with immense resources and a population that could raise any kind of an army that they want okay if they had rulership over the planet it would be one thing but there's this bit of an island and they don't call it Britain, it's Great Britain, <laughs> right? And, and this speck of an island rules the planet. You know, it's, it's like uh, Gideon when he was trying to raise up the army and our Heavenly Father said, no, let those guys go. And because he was gonna show his mighty hand. 
And so that's just the way it is. So, uh, <clears throat> um, if they stack these charges up on me, like I say tomorrow, I was looking at multiple lifetimes. Uh, and well, one of the things was, uh, it was um, at the beginning, it was like uh, December 3rd was a court date for me to show up in court on. On these uh, multiple cases that they stacked up on you, did you use allocution on any of them or all? Uh, I beat them all before sentencing. Right, did all. you use that doc? Allocution is at sentencing, but they never got me there. Oh. I, uh, I beat all this everything uh, I mean they got zero victories on all nine charges they got zero victories so far and um, they're making rumblings about more but I think that they got a problem because it's pretty plain and clear to everyone now that it's a religious and political persecution you know? so they had me come to court on December 3rd and <coughs> there they re-arrested me. This is back in uh, December 3rd, 2008. So they re-arrested me right there in the court. By the way, I came to the court and I'm carrying the Bible. And I said to the bailiff, I said, uh, I heard some rumors that there's a, a charge against me, uh, a warrant for my arrest. And I said, would you please check on that? And so he checks and click, click with the handcuffs. And they got, you know, this other charge against me. So put me in jail. Now the other charge, the one that they were, this new thing that they were putting on me was baritry. And most people don't know what baritry is, but if you're not familiar to there. Anyway, uh, baritry, the full title of the thing is Baritry and Solicitation of Professional Employment. And the statute lists who can do that. And it's licensed attorneys, because they can do like ambulance chasing, you know, and, uh, and try and get customers. You know, as you're going into the hospital in the gurney, they can give you a business card and say, somebody smashed into you, call me, we can sue them, you know. And, uh, uh, it's, it's that kind of activity. So licensed attorneys, licensed medical doctors, licensed chiropractors, licensed medical staff, like nursing staff and so on, and licensed uh, uh, investigators, they're all listed in the statute. But I have no license. I don't even have a driver's license. Okay, I have no license. And I'm not on the list. And I can't solicit professional employment anyway, as I've explained to you from the beginning. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a professional. And that's the end of that. Okay? So they're accusing me of baritry. It's complete nonsense. And they put me in jail. The bond was set at $30,000. Uh, friends paid the bond. By the way, the first time that they tried bonding me out, I, I just flat refused. I wouldn't sign their papers. I wouldn't get a bond out or anything. But my friends around me said, well, Robert, you, you know, you need to get out, not only to fight your own case, but you know, you've got other people that are depending on you for help and so on. And, well, Okay. Other than that, I was just going to stay, you know, because I could drive a buggy from in there. <laughs> so 
and the bear tree saying, friends bonded me out. I filed a claim against the city, against their risk management, for what the bear tree thing was. And then they rearrested me because of that. They were going to retaliate against me because I made a claim about the false arrest on the bear tree and the false incarceration in that. So they rearrest me and they call it tampering with a government record. And it's another felony. And in Texas, they multiply this stuff. If they got two or more felonies, they multiply it. And so now I'm looking like a, a felony one, uh, which is life in prison, you know, 25 to life. 25 years added to me. It doesn't matter whether they want to say it could be life in prison. 25 years is it anyway. You know, what am I going to do? I'm 62. Add 25 to that, you'll be 87. <laughs> One of the biggest problems in the, in the jail system, of course, is no medical care. You know, it doesn't matter what your problem is, tough luck. Tylenol. Now that solves everything. <laughs> So, so uh, they jailed me on January 23rd for the tampering with the government record simply because I made a claim against the city. And so I'm looking at life in prison and it wasn't that that was the biggest problem. It was that there were people I was trying to help and I knew that people were going to die over. And some people did. Two men died and one almost committed suicide, well, attempted suicide. And so I was jailed on January 23rd, 2009. And by January 26th, just three days later, something happened. And I would share with you that you know, by the hand of our Heavenly Father, at that county jail, one of the guys who runs the jail is Lieutenant Parsons. And he has his own church, and he's a preacher. Him coming in to run the jail changed everything. All new bedding, food improved. He would not tolerate any guard disrespecting any inmate, period. If they disrespected an inmate, they were called on the carpet. And I guess probably if it happened a second time, they were fired. So with him running the thing, when I, I was in solitary, so press the button on the intercom that I'm having a problem. So they came with the stuff to measure the blood pressure and the rest of that. And, and uh, you know, I knew I was having a problem, but I didn't know how bad it was. And the guard that came said, well, we gotta call the paramedics. Paramedics came and when they checked me, they said, time for the hospital. And so I was whisked away in an ambulance from the jail to the hospital in an ambulance uh, for nitro and oxygen. Now Susie here was arranged the seminar. She apparently had several heart attacks because of the pressure put on her in, in the system. And um, again, the reason I'm explaining this stuff is because so everyone will know the dangers of their system and where I'm coming from and how we can know what to do in the various situations. And we're gonna, we're gonna plow through some pretty amazing stuff this weekend. And, um, one of the things is, is um, you know, the uh, test.
testimony versus noise. If you don't make a testimony, then it's just noise. And the way we make a testimony is this, and I'm, I'll provide you a sheet on this, by the way, okay? So, so the way we make a testimony is this, you know, the, the attorney speaks, the judge is listening, and then the judge says, well, Mr. Fox, what do you have to say? And they expect me to just start talking. But instead, what I say to them is, I understand that I'm to accurately state the facts, and if I knowingly inaccurately state the facts, I may subject myself to penalties for perjury under the laws of the United States of America. Having qualified my testimony here today, I hereby state for the record, and then I go into it. And now it's testimony, and I'm up here, and they're down in the basement. Okay? Because nothing, what the attorney says, counts for, for anything. And that's like uh, Mr. Heitman pointed out, is the case uh, Trinity versus Pagliaro, and there's other cases, you know. Uh, and on the agency case, I, the federal one is federal crop insurance versus Merrill. And you have a duty to inquire as to the scope of their agency. And it says that uh, because the agent may be unaware of the limitations on his own authority. And that happens all over the place. That happened for me trying to get to this seminar. I was, went to the airport at Tyler, Texas, and they have a puddle jumper that takes from Tyler to Dallas-Fort Worth, which is one of the most incredible airports in the world. But the TSA wouldn't let me on. They would not let me on the plane at Tyler. Why? Well, I don't, allegedly I don't have the identification stuff that they want, like a driver's license or a passport. Well, I had a passport. Uh, I trailed off on that one too. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a second. Then I'll finish this and thank you for reminding me. So, I don't have a driver's license, I don't have a passport. These things were stolen from me, okay? So, and I, and also, immigration had a card that they required me to have it on my person at all times. And I'm thinking to myself, I have to have it in the shower too. <laughs> 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 and, and anyway, that's how ridiculous it gets. But here's the funny part is that these guys already know me. There was a Tyler police officer right there. We remember you from five years back. And, you know, they know me. So what are the heck are they going to get from looking at a driver's license? To know who I am? They already know who I am. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the same thing happened at the federal court, by the way. Like I was explaining, the Tyler court, they won't let me in there. But that Tyler court is not the only one in what they call the Eastern District of Texas. In Marshall, Texas, which is in the Eastern District, I filed a civil lawsuit. And then, even though I have a, I filed a civil lawsuit when Alan Jackson showed up out there, something else happened. And the something else was that suddenly the U.S. Marshals wouldn't let me in that building. How about it? I got, I paid the 350 bucks to file a civil lawsuit, and now I can't come into the building to file my papers. <laughs> so, um, and then this affected uh, uh, friends, Tim and Don, on a tax evasion case. They, they, uh, uh, July 5th was jury selection. So they picked me up and we went to the court in Marshall. And they were being prosecuted by Alan Jackson, the same guy that prosecuted Dr. Brooks. And, uh, but the judge was different. So, um, it was jury selection on July the 5th. But the U.S. Marshals wouldn't let me in the building. 
even though they know exactly who I am because they don't have a Texas driver's license. Well, if the, if the week before I did a name change and changed my name to Elmer Fudd and got a Texas driver's license and presented the Texas driver's license saying that I'm Elmer Fudd, I could count on it that they would have arrested me claiming that it was falsification. They know that I'm Robert Fox. <laughs> Get that picture. <laughs> That's how absurd some of this stuff gets. But anyway, uh, they, they, uh, um, my train of thought. Uh, Ten minutes. Yeah. So, um, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me in. So I couldn't, and by the way, it's the law that if, if there's a hearing, if there's something happening in the courtroom, it's public, okay? But this public can't get in there if you, if you understand what I'm getting at. So I had to sit in a restaurant across the street. The whole day was wasted for me. And uh, that was July the 5th. July the 6th was the beginning of their trial. I said to them, well, there's no point in me going because I can't get in. July the 7th, Tim, who's an economics professor, and Tyler, by the way, at the college, and his lovely wife, Dawn, who works at a health food store. Anyway, um, Tim goes ahead and subpoenas me for their, their trial. <laughs> so, because I have the subpoena, now I can come in. <laughs> now, when they come in, they have five U.S. Marshals flanking me into the courtroom. Now, what does it look like? For the jury, I'm the only witness that comes in flanked by five U.S. Marshals. It's like I'm Osama bin Laden or something worse. <laughs> and, and so that taints the jury right there. And the judge's assistant says, uh, you know, for me to raise my right hand and do the oath, is that I have a religious objection pursuant to Matthew 5. That's as far as I could get. The judge was barreling over the top of me and, and with a ferocious tonality and everything else cutting me off. So I didn't get to say Matthew 5:33 to 37 and James 5:12, which is make no swearing at all. And I used my little statement normally, but this guy wasn't going to have any of that and denied my testimony. And I, when I saw the shift happening, I was thinking to myself, I can't believe this is happening because in the civil suit, I warned him, and he's supposed to read that stuff in the civil suit. And I warned him on July 29th in a filing about exactly what was happening. I mean, on June 29th in a filing, exactly what was happening on July 7th when he denied my testimony. As I mentioned earlier, religious freedom is serious. So there was a case in the Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Cir Federal Circuit of Appeals, is Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Not that that's a big deal, but their bosses issued a ruling in a case called Ferguson versus Commissioner of Internal Revenue. And Ferguson was denied her testimony at trial because she had a religious objection to the oath. And then what happens? The IRS wins. Right, because she can't get any of her evidence in because she can't testify. So it goes up to the, on appeal, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they ruled the court, that's the trial court, the court abused its discretion in refusing the testimony of a witness offered on religious grounds. That's like a two by four upside the head for the trial court judge. Yeah. And then they go on to say that it's against the First Amendment and contrary to the federal rules of evidence, rule 603, we reverse, kaboom, <laughs> you know, because they denied her testimony. So this, this 
judge with Tim and Don's case, he's denying my testimony. And I go outside the court and would, uh, they basically threw me out. And what, I couldn't even sit down and watch the rest of the proceedings. The U.S. Marshals out of the building, you know, like that. And so I wait outside and finally Tim and Don come out and Don's got tears running down her cheeks and the jury convicted them. Well, the thing is that uh, um, they, they had years to prepare and they hadn't really prepared. And now they get convicted and, you know, I mean, she's, Dawn's crying and Tim's distraught. And I said, well, it's not over yet because when he denied my testimony, they created a hell of a problem for themselves. And so I filed my amicus curiae affidavit backed by three witness affidavits. And the judge who formerly issued all of his edicts on one page was faced with something where his response was 15 pages, <laughs> you know, trying to cover up what he had done. But I don't think it's covered up, so we'll see how it shakes out. But uh, by the way, it's the power of affidavits too, because I talked with uh, uh, another guy, he's in federal lockup in, in Mississippi, and he, for the purposes of his trial, he had utilized the uh, uh, help of a guy who's well known, I won't mention his name, but anyway, allegedly charges 25000 for a case, okay? So, but this guy is a guy who believes that you do this stuff by motions. And so I asked the guy who's a prisoner, now that he's contacting me, now that he's convicted and contacting me, he said, Did, you know, and I knew the other, the other uh, guy who was helping him, and he's a good guy, you know. I mean, we're all trying our best, you know. Uh, and I said, he did motions, right? And the, the prisoner said, yes, he did motions. And uh, I said, well, did that do any good? He said, no, no good at all. And that's the problem. See, attorneys do motions. Attorney versus attorney, that works out, oh, you know, there's going to be something there. But for us, if you don't do affidavits, you've got a problem. Because motions are pretty please may I, they are begging. And what you get out of that is denied. That's what you get. One word, denied. Anyway, how are we doing time-wise? So I kind of trailed off, I, 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 uh, we get on these tangents and it derails me. Uh, I was explaining to you earlier about when I was at the Federal Torture Facility in Springfield, Missouri, uh, there's one little piece there that I should share with you. Uh, there was an inmate there uh, and he wrote home to his parents and he told them in the letter that he didn't expect that uh, he'd be living very long because he, he figured they were going to murder him. And uh, he wrote them a letter on Friday, and on Monday when, and he told them in the letter, he, he figured that by the time they'd be reading the letter, he'd already be dead. And uh, they got the letter on Monday, and uh, he was dead. Uh, I sat in the cafeteria with a guy who, had been at an adjacent cell and was forced to clean up the blood and the mess on the walls. Like it, it beat the crud out of him, blood all over the place. And this guy had to clean the walls and then they moved him to another part of the place so that he wouldn't be there when, <clears throat> when they, um, you know, when there was any investigation. And uh, uh, 60 Minutes did a, an expose on the place at the Federal Torture Facility in Springfield. 60 Minutes was there just before my arrival. And the Bureau of Prisons 
tried to get a court injunction to block the airing of the material on 60 Minutes. And 60 Minutes fought it. And, it, and I think it was around April 1991 that they aired the interviews and uh, of people who had suffered uh, terribly and uh, you know with, with the federal system uh, they there was a woman got into an argument with the postman about her welfare check and they put her in a lockup and uh, federal lockup and she had seizure medication which they took away from her and wouldn't let her have and 60 Minutes was interviewing one of the inmates who had been released and was across the street from the place. And this female inmate said that Isabella Suarez went into seizures and uh, that the inmates were alarmed and wanted to do something. <clears throat> that they literally called 911 and the paramedics came but were not allowed in and Isabella Suarez died as the prosecution gave up on the case and would have released her because it was it didn't really amount to a crime. So, you know, it's the kind, that kind of thing that can happen to anybody and most people don't even realize it. That, you know, uh, if you had some bad words with somebody or just anything, you know, just any little thing, and they point the finger at you and click, click with the handcuffs and, and the rest of that, and next thing you know, you got a real big problem. Like, for instance, me, when, when I felt that I was having a problem because I was really stressed out about, not that I would just have to spend time in jail because I've done plenty of time in jail, but there were people on the outside that I knew were depending on me. and. I knew that if I was in jail, I couldn't help them. Not at least, why not like I had been, you know. And so my heart just started pounding, and it was like I felt a tightness in my chest, and I, I knew that it was my heart was racing, and, and even I, I couldn't, you know, even with like trying to do meditation techniques with, with peace and tranquility, you know, it just wasn't working. <laughs> and, and so I had rushed to the hospital myself. And Susie could tell you that, you know, she got rushed to the hospital. Uh, some of these places, they don't do that. They'll let you die first. So it's terrible. And it's part of the reason why we have to have our own education. Because attorneys don't really help you. Those who don't know. I, I, uh, I should probably address that issue right now with, with one of what I think is one of the clearest examples. You all have heard of Mel Gibson, Paris Hilton, Lindsay Lohan, uh, Kiefer Sutherland, Nicole Ritchie, David Hasselhoff. You've all heard of these people? Are they all drunks? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're all drunks, but let's just say they all got dinged with a DWI. And of course, they got big bucks. Uh, I can't imagine them spending anything less than 50000 on an attorney. They probably could have spent a quarter of a million. I can imagine Paris Hilton spending a million. You know, I, I mean, what is it to her? Uh, I mean, her grandfather cut her out of the, out of the will uh, to the tune of $60 million, you know, for her sex videos. And, uh, but anyway, these people have big bucks. They paid big bucks. Does anyone think that they tried to find the dumbest attorney that they could get? <laughs> no, they went and they got the best that they could get. I mean, if they would have reached outside of California or, or whatever, they would have done whatever they could. And they certainly have the money to accomplish it. <clears throat> Yet every one of them was put in jail was convicted, has a permanent criminal record, and pays the fine on top of paying the attorney. 
every one of them. Now, I don't have a Yellow Pages ad. I don't have an advertisement at halftime in the Super Bowl or anything like that. But some people do, uh, you know, call about different issues. And, and uh, what I do, of course, is just educate. So uh, I've had just two people come to me about DWI stuff that was 25 to life, like third hit deals, okay? And, and um, both of those cases, I only have two, and both of those cases won me both. Now, how is it possible for somebody who isn't an attorney to win 25 to life DWI cases and attorneys can't? What's wrong with this picture? It aspire to throw you to the walls. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, uh, another one on, on the, while we're on the same vein, uh, I have a good friend uh, in Dallas, and he has a daughter, and she married a fellow that is a professional locksmith. And that's a career where you have to be bonded, okay? There's no felons out there doing locksmithing, <laughs> okay? So, so uh, he, had, he had some kind of road rage event and, um, and he pulled off the Dallas 635 loop into Garland. I mentioned Garland before yes. about arresting me six times and never taking me to trial. I'll tell you another funny about Garland, just right quick here. Dallas police are instructed not to engage in high speed pursuits on the city streets. It is far too dangerous. The liability is sky high. Okay? But if you're close to Garland, chase them into Garland because in Garland, they will shoot to kill first and ask questions later. <laughs> you know, that's how they are there. So anyway, <clears throat> this guy pulls off the, the Dallas 635 loop and he's in Garland. And the, the bad guy who's creating the problem pulls off after him. Now this guy's getting out of his car and is threatening the locksmith as he's doing so. And the locksmith says, you better get back in your car because I have a gun. And the, the guy calls the cops. Now Garland cops are rough and tough, okay? And so they come and uh, they talk to the guy who's complaining, and he says, well, that guy said he had a gun, and he pointed the gun at me. Okay? Well, that didn't happen. Okay? And the guy said he pointed this uh, pistol at him. Well, the only gun that was in the locksmith's truck was an unloaded uh, rifle. So, and, and it was, you know how these trucks are? They've got like a, uh, a metal cage type thing behind them so that in an emergency stop and stuff crashes forward, it doesn't bash the driver's head into the windshield. He's got this cage there, so the only way he can access that gun, which didn't have any bullets, is to get out of the van, go around, get open the side door, go in there, and then get the gun, right? So the police do that, they go in the side door, they get the gun and they go and show it to the other guy and say, is this the gun that he had? And he says, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> it's, it's, so, so he's up on this, you know, uh, heavy duty felony for, you know, this thing with the gun and all. And my friend calls me and he says, my son-in-law is in this trouble and blah, blah. And, and I explained to him, I said, you know, if it was me, I would sit down at the kitchen table, write up the whole thing, 
make sure it's all in order and that you're not forgetting anything. And then I would go down to the Dallas Grand Jury and get in there and explain to the Grand Jury what happened. And I said, I think that that will work for him. Well, they were, they were um, plenty apprehensive about the whole situation. Because not only was he facing prison time, but even after doing the prison time, his career would be gone. And, and what's the wife to do in the interim? You know? and, uh, so it's a big enough problem. Uh, and so they were really nervous. And they went and they got themselves an attorney. Now, this was no ordinary attorney. This was a judge attorney. This guy had been a judge for a number of years, and now he was in private practice. But because of his exalted status of being a judge, you know, he told them, well, it'll be $5,000 down for this thing. Now, he didn't tell them how to derail or sidestep the whole issue. And when this locksmith went down to the Dallas County Grand Jury and explained to them what had happened, they know building. The case was finished right there. There was no indictment. There was no no real substance to it. It was finished, over, done, and gone. The attorney never gave back a dime. You know, and uh, and uh, I mean, I I help people as best I can. But it, it, It's, it's uh, you know, I didn't get that kind of reward. <laughs> but but the, the attorney who did nothing got the reward. You know, it's just the way it is. Anyway, um, uh, this the, the issue here is what attorneys do. See, Is it possible for this yeah. judge attorney not to know what I just shared with the locksmith? I don't think so. I think he knew full well how to bring the case to an end like that. The snap of his fingers to say, we're going to the grand jury, explain it to them, it'll be over. Not profitable. That's right. Not profitable. Not profitable for the attorney. So what they do is they will, will let things stretch out and trial isn't good enough for them. They get you convicted at trial so that you can do an appeal at a lot more expense. And I met with a guy in Dallas one time and he wanted to tell me about his case. I said, just for fun, let me tell you about your case. <laughs> and every step of the way, he said, yeah, that's what they did. Yeah, that's what they did. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's that their their modus operandi, you know. So that's just the way it is. Um, uh, let's see. Robert, yeah. You left off an affidavit. So I wasn't sure if you actually had finished what you were going to say about that. No, I'm not finished. Um, I have one here. Uh, and you know, on the break, if you want to look at it, uh, and I was going to make a copy of an affidavit. As a matter of fact, what I was going to do was the amicus curiae for Dr. Brooks, because people will hardly people look at that and they're like stunned with the language I used on them, you know. And like I say, they wouldn't let me in the federal courthouse after that. And you can see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seriously, I know you need to see it. And and uh, bring it fast. Bring it fast, faster. <laughs> uh, I've got it on the computer, and I brought and I bought a uh, printer so that I'd be able to print this stuff up. And and you know the time was such that I I didn't have a chance to to run off some of the things that I was going to run off. But we're going to get to it. Don't worry, we'll get to it. So um, 
that was one of the things I want to give you is is that and um, and with regards to affidavits, what do I have here? I want to say something. You said affidavits are supreme. They're 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 on up there. All affidavits are hearsay until they're testified to. But if you do everything by affidavit, who's opposing you? The attorney doesn't do affidavits. So you're set up to win on affidavits alone. Okay? Now, if they do counter affidavits, then you know, it goes to the next level and you have an evidentiary hearing. And by the way, in O'Connor's, they'll tell you that there's two kinds of hearing. Hearings for argument, hearings for evidence. And that they don't like the ones for evidence, okay? They want the hearings for argument because the attorney argues and you argue. And like I said, that's just noise. So the judge gets to decide which noise he likes. So it all goes against you and the attorneys make lots of money. Now, when you're doing it all by affidavit, it's a different matter. And if they do a counter affidavit, then you get to, to demand an evidentiary hearing and somebody's affidavit's gotta be false, you know? And so um, that's why they'll they'll try and convert your work to to motions. And so what actually it happens countless times? Uh, the black bat suit says, uh, "I've considered the defense motions, and they are all denied." And then somebody with some strength, like Ron, speaks up and says. I did not file any motions. I filed affidavits. And the black bat suit says, well, I'm treating your documents as motions. And then Ron says, again, I did not file any motions. I filed affidavits. It is a criminal offense to file a false affidavit. I notice I am not under arrest for filing a false affidavit. So it is clear that my affidavits are true, correct, and accurate. An affidavit is a statement of truth, so my uncontested affidavits are the truth. Are you deliberately denying the truth in order to falsify the record? Is it your intent to falsify the record and create denial of due process? Speak up, I can't hear you. <laughs> and then there's there's cases, and I'm going to give you copies of both of these things, this, this script about affidavits, and this here are the cases. There's um, a case, Morris versus National Cash Register, and an affidavit uncontested on the record for 30 days because it becomes undisputed fact as a matter of law. Okay? So, and, and there's a federal rule of evidence, I think it's 902. You could take your affidavit, file it in the public record, and now you've got something that's got some real juice there. A UCC thing? No, no. Or just file with the Secretary of State? Okay, every county has a county clerk and recorder where births, deaths, deeds, and mortgages are filed. And you go in there with your affidavit, and um, some of them will give you some static, okay? Because you'll say, I want to file this. They say, well, we don't have a place to file that. Go away. No, you have a miscellaneous file, and I want this filed in the miscellaneous file. And they can still give you some grief. And in Cherokee County, where they brought all these charges against me, they would, would not file my affidavits in the county clerk and recorder. No problem. I go one, one county over to Smith County and they'd already been sued about that and they lost. So when I come in there and I put it on their desk, no problem, Mr. Fox. They click their heels, smile, take the cash, 
and say thank you. <laughs> That's how that goes. Okay? So if you can't get success in one county, you find one where you can get success. And if you if you go to too many and if you go to the one you're in in four other counties, just contact me and we'll find a county for you. Because there are some that will file anything and the reason they file it is because they've been sued and lost. Now with property records, you gotta be in the same county you're in. Right, property records. But if you've got uh, if you've got some documents that you want to file and you want to uh, declare, like say this locksmith, he could done up his stuff, declare what happened there, file it as an affidavit in the public record, and if it had gone beyond the grand jury thing, he could have brought it into court and filed it in the court, and it would have all the stuff right on the top of it that it was filed in the in the uh, county clerk and recorder's office and they should recognize it as a ticking time bomb basically how why is it more powerful because so nobody regretted it at the, at that exactly because it's a matter of public record when you file it in there and it's like bigger a bigger public record than the narrow confines of the case It all comes down to it though that, that an affidavit is the closest thing to testimony. But like I say, it's still, uh, all affidavits are hearsay until they are testified to. But if there's no counter affidavit, they got a problem because your stuff is gonna stand then. Now, um, the elements of an affidavit real quick before you start one. Well, you have to, you have to uh, declare who you are and uh, that uh, you have personal knowledge, that you're age of majority, that you're mentally competent, um, and all that stuff is in those encyclopedias, by the way, amateur or corpus juris, and you might want to familiarize yourself with that stuff because those are like the Encyclopedia Britannica of law, and they will give you a whole bunch of state cases, or even federal cases, where certain issues have already been adjudicated. And I'm mentioning this not just on, because of affidavits, because of anything that you want to work with and do, you might want to look it up there, because you can pick up information that reinforces what you're trying to accomplish. Does that make sense, folks? Okay. Um, I have, uh, with the affidavit like that I did with with Dr. Brooks, or this one that I, I did for Tim and Don Patton, um, I get this all in this one paragraph right here. Can you all see this? Yeah, <laughs> I say the white and black. Yeah, the white and black. <laughs> okay. Well, this part up here is called the style of the case for those who are novices. Right here, this part where it says the court and it says the United States of America versus Tim and Don and the case number. This is a federal format. The state format looks a little bit different, but it has this information in it and it's called the style of the case. Okay, and it tells the clerk, you know, basically that it's this court, it's this case number, these parties, okay? Then I've got my title of the document, which I, you know, I'm just kind of noisy that way, <laughs> you know? So that's, I, I make this gigantic bold letters and, uh, and then this part here is what qualifies the affidavit in this first paragraph here. And then I go on to facts, okay? Now, at the end of this thing, wow. 
I have a paragraph over here, which I make my last paragraph. And this is the paragraph that, that protects you. And what it says here is this. I'm not an expert in the law, however, I do know right from wrong. If there is any human being damaged by any statements herein, if he will inform me by facts, I will sincerely make every effort to amend my ways. I hereby and herein reserve the right to amend and make amendment to this document as necessary in order that the truth be that the truth may be ascertained and proceedings justly determined. That phrase, that the uh, truth be ascertained and proceedings justly determined, is taken right out of the rules of evidence. And before that, I'm saying I reserve the right to amend. So if they say, uh, Mr. Fox, you've got something in paragraph 9 that's wrong, and it's falsification of the record, and, and this is virtually testimony, and we'd like to prosecute you for this, falsification of the record. My comeback on that is, now it's never happened, by the way, but my comeback would be that not a paragraph, not a sentence, not a phrase, not a single word is to be taken out of context. The, the affidavit is to be taken as a whole, which includes the last paragraph where I say, I reserve the right to amend. Right? Now, if you saw somebody, for instance, if you saw somebody squeeze off on, squeeze on the trigger with a big Colt 45, and there's a mighty bang, and flames come out of the barrel, and this other guy goes back and blood and guts fly out of, him, out of his back. Now, what does that look like to you? Yeah, you saw the guy who killed him. Now, what if this was in front of the saloon in Knott's Berry Farm, where they do these things routinely, except that the blood and guts don't come flying out of the guy? But you saw it, and it looks like murder. It looks like that guy who squeezed the trigger shot and killed that other guy. But you don't know whether there was simultaneously a sniper a thousand yards away. Right? So were you perjuring yourself when you described what, what you saw and your conclusion? I don't think so. You, you getting the picture? So anybody could make a mistake in an affidavit. And sometimes it's a typographical mixed mistake that they never saw. Uh, sometimes it's, it's something else. But this last paragraph is to protect you. So continuing here about after the truth may be ascertained and proceedings justly determined, and they just can't argue with that. It's part of their own rules of evidence. If the parties given notice by means of this document have information that would controvert and overcome this affidavit, please advise me in a written affidavit form within 30 days from receipt hereof, providing me with your counter affidavit, proving with particularity by stating all requisite actual evidentiary fact and all requisite actual law, not merely the ultimate facts or conclusions of law, that this affidavit statement is substantially and materially false sufficiently to change materially my status and factual declarations. Your silence stands as consent to and tacit approval of the factual declarations herein being established as fact as a matter of law. They're already warned. Okay? May the will of our Heavenly Father Yavah, through the power and authority of the blood of His Son Yeshua, be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Yeshua, by the way, this is, you know, it's Jesus Christ in the Greek and Yeshua in the Hebrew, okay? So, um, that paragraph will protect you. And I think that's important to know. Yeah. So, 
And what I do in the computer is I set these things up like, like a template, you know, and I have this, if I've, if I've got a case, I have this stuff with the case number and everything. And I leave the title blank. I've got this paragraph because that's always standard. And the ending with the last paragraph and the signature stuff, you know, that's all standard. And then I can fill in the meat and potatoes of anything else that I want to put in here. And a lot of times I write up the document and don't put a title until I'm finished. Law is such simple stuff when you get right down to it. You need, you've got something in your head, you need to express it, you start putting it down in writing, and it starts becoming clear, you know, as you formulate it on paper. And when you're done, you look at it and you say, well, this needs to be called such and such. Does that make sense? And so that's how it goes. Yeah, uh, Robert really fantastic, but could we just bring our thumb drives tomorrow and give all these templates on our thumb drives? Uh, we could get some. Yeah. We, got a, we got a computer guy here, a couple of computer guys who can do the transfer for us. It's up to you. Okay. We'll make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> Put that in an affidavit for <laughs> So, um, in Missouri, I had a traffic thing, and, uh, you know, these judges would try and arraign me, and uh, I don't arraign very well. In, in the federal court system, you know, the Richardson police arrested me in 1990, and it's a published case, and, and the, uh, the thing is that it just says, you know, Fox was arrested uh, October 9th, blah, blah, blah. It continues on for a bit, and then it says, the, uh, the court entered a plea of not guilty for Mr. Fox, who defended himself doesn't say that I ever entered a plea of not guilty. And they have the date there, I forget what date it was, but they have the date there. And uh, the, the thing is that it was 184 days from arrest to arraignment. And it was, still was not a plea by me in the day. So, so, um, uh, in Missouri, I wasn't going along with their arraignment there either. And uh, then they, they'd start trying to get funky with me. And so I did up affidavits declaring that they were, you know, liars and thieves and so on. And <laughs> I blew off every judge in the county and the Supreme Court of Missouri had to appoint a special judge from another county over a traffic ticket. <laughs> and, and, and then, by that time, the prosecutor was absolutely livid. And he came in and, and he says, we have it all right here, Your Honor. He called the, the, the honorable judges of the great state of Missouri. He called them liars and thieves. We got it here. And he, he got his signature and his thumbprint seal and, and all of this. And, and carrying on, you know, and he said, excuse me, those affidavits are all over 30 days uncontested. They're undisputed fact as a matter of law. Yeah. This guy wanted to nail me for a major contempt, you know. He would have liked to see me put away for years. <laughs> you know? He couldn't make it to first base because those affidavits were uncontested. <laughs> and him ranting and raving in the courtroom didn't change that. <laughs> there was a guy who called me from, from federal prison and he uh, said he's okay he's sending me some of his stuff and then he'd call me and check with me after. So he sent me his stuff, and then he calls me afterwards, and he says, well, what do you think? And I said, well, first off, I think you're a genius. 
And, and I think that your work is really incredible. And uh, he said, yeah, but I'm still in prison. <laughs> and, and I said, well, that's because you're doing your stuff as motions. And you need to do them as affidavits. And I explained to him some of the stuff I've explained to you here. So a few months go by, doorbell rings. This guy's on the doorstep, stuffs some cash in my shirt pocket, takes me out for a bite to eat, and tells me how much he appreciates the fact that he gave the feds back 250 years in prison time. <laughs> so, I think that affidavits work. And like I say, I've run into people who, you know. Uh, do they have, do you have to serve an affidavit on the you know, who you're, who you're, who you're. Okay, the answer to that is yes and no. Depends on what the document is, okay? What was the question for the camera? Okay, for the, for the people on, on the video, and, and then the question was, do you have to serve the affidavit on the other party? And, the, and I said the answer is yes and no. Here's this, this one, and I'm giving administrative notice and demand, uh, presented by affidavit of Mikas Curia Robert J. Adams. Now this one gets filed in the court, and on the very last page, we have what's called a certificate of service, and that's where you declare or certify that you have given it to the other party or parties. In this case, being a criminal case, the other party is the U.S. attorney or his assistant, okay? In a civil case, there might be 20 other parties or even 100 other parties, and you have to list them, and you have to certify with your signature that you have sent the information to each and every one of them. Now, so far, I'm telling you that you have to send a copy to everyone. Now, the difference comes when you have a document like a habeas corpus. A habeas corpus gets filed with the court, and that's it. The In the style of the case up here at the top, it's if you're doing it for yourself, you put ex parte and in your name. Ex parte means, well, let me say this. Just, we'll just draw a diagram here so that everybody can get this. case for instance you have this kind of arrangement you got the judge here there's me there's the prosecutor when anyone in this triangle does anything he's supposed to notify everyone so if the prosecutor makes a document he files it with the court clerk and then gets it to the judge but he also has an obligation to send me a copy when I make a document, I have to send him a copy and I have to certify on the document, like he has to too, certify on the document, that he has given me a copy. I have to certify that I've given him a copy and I certify it to the court clerk who gives it to the judge. So there's nothing happening in oh, and, and the judge. Even if the judge issues an order, he has to send a copy to me and he has to send a copy to the prosecutor. And this is so that there's no hanky-panky going on, okay? Because what is, it's called ex parte communications if this guy talks to the judge privately without me. Or if I try and talk to the judge, maybe to give him a bribe or something. And the prosecutor's left out of the loop, of course. 
Okay? Well, this is in theory how the system maintains some sort of integrity. The reality is that the prosecutor and the judge, they go to the same parties together. They're, you know, they're constantly socializing with the, with one another and their communications are always going and you are left out of the loop kind of thing is and that's the reality now there are some judges with integrity i can't say that this is always the case but uh We're they for him. they do what what's good for them i in dallas i knew an attorney by the name of robert rose and uh Things developed, uh, there was a, let me say this, I had a friend whose whining and winching budget was like $20,000 a month, okay? <laughs> and, and he's a young fellow, he had a hot, hot Mercedes convertible and, and, and then, you know, when he, they'd go out and, and party with the babes from the topless bar and the rest of that, and they, have the penthouse suite at the Sheraton and all that stuff. Anyway, he's the one that introduced me to Robert Rose. And I visited Robert Rose at his place and his cash is stacked up on the table and the rest of that. Um, he got one guy off for having, I think, it was a thousand or two thousand pounds of marijuana in his living room. Got him off, it was for personal use. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but then things are kind of unraveled because this kind of communication here, uh, what the deal was is that, you know, there'd be these drug cases and Robert Rose would get a large amount of money and the judge would get a chunk and people would get set free. And, and then they'd all go and party in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, reality can be a little bit different. But anyway, the FBI caught up with him and they put a stop to that. Uh, it, and Robert Rose turned evidence, state's evidence, against a whole bunch of judges in Dallas taking bribes. And, and it, you know, it was a big, big problem. Big problem. Um, so, um, to go over these what I call powerful tools and we're going to do some more of that in just a second and also I'm going to go but what I intend to do is to show you from uh, the process the criminal process from indictment arraignment pretrial trial and allocution appeal etc habeas corpus all that in and how you can win at every step of the proceedings. Okay, something I forgot to share with you, uh, I got off on that one of those tangents. Now, that federal case in 1990-91, when they sent me to the federal torture facility in Springfield, Missouri, when I came back from that event, federal judge Barefoot Sanders and I had a flat out screaming match both of us as loud as we could possibly go. Him demanding that I have an attorney and me telling him in no uncertain terms I absolutely was not going to have one. And the screaming and yelling was going nowhere. So he finally said, marshals, remove this man. And I was bodily removed from the courtroom. A week later, I'd already filed some paperwork that declared my position and uh, I was brought back into court and I prevailed in that argument. So I was going to trial with no attorney, no standby attorney, no attorney, period. So, <clears throat> and in the jail cell, um, <laughs> there was a funny, uh, you want me to share it with you? Sure. Okay. So, I'm 
I'm in I'm in this lockup at Mansfield, Texas, contracted with the feds to pre federal pretrial detainees. Well, one of my cellmates is a fellow by the name of Mike Wilson. He had been 10 years top prosecutor in Dallas, followed by 10 years top federal criminal defense attorney. If you add a, a, a federal uh, indictment and called him up, it was $100,000 right off the top, okay? And there he was, he was my cellmate. Uh -huh. <laughs> And, and what was hundred thousand dollars in the in the free world was um, chocolate bars in the uh, in the jail. So we we had some interesting discussions, and uh, he was he was uh, you know he, he had a, he had a head on his shoulders. He understood a, a lot of stuff. The interesting thing is that. He and I were being prosecuted by a female prosecutor, both of us prosecuted by the same female prosecutor, and he's the one who trained her. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, as things progressed, you know, I had filed the, what, the correct lawful winning arguments again and again and again and again. This is the time when when I didn't understand affidavits, I was doing motions. And they were denied, denied, denied every time. So here's this judge, he's denying all the correct lawful winning arguments. And as I get close to trial, I declared that I was waiving the jury, which meant that the judge was gonna have to decide the case. And my cellmate said, you are crazy. <laughs> and and uh, my, my contention was that you can't hold the jury to the law, but you can hold the judge to the law. So, and the law was on my side as far as I was concerned. So that's the way I was gonna do it. And, uh, and I filed my, my documents, and the judge had ordered the prosecutor, this female prosecutor that was prosecuting me and Mike Wilson, he had ordered her to answer. So the day came, I'm sitting in the cell, I get the mail, and I got her five-page answer, and she's making an argument in one direction on page one and the exact opposite on page two and back somewhere else on page three and elsewhere on page four. And I'm sitting there looking at this stuff and I think, am I losing my mind? And I, I crossed the way in the pod there to, to Mike Wilson. I said, you trained her. Do you understand this stuff? And he looked at it and he said, uh, he said, she's okay until she runs into a detour and then uh, forget it. You know? And he said, this is completely, he said, you're right. He said, this is completely gibberish and it's uh, incomprehensible, you know. And uh, so we go to trial and, and uh, uh, Barefoot Sanders knew what was going to happen. And the way the trial starts up, you know, he comes in, he says, uh, we're on the record, case number such and such, United States of America versus Robert Fox. And uh, is the government ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Fox, you ready to proceed? No. Why not? Well, I have motions before the court and they've been unanswered. He said, well, would you like to argue your motions? I said, I certainly would. He said, very well, proceed, Mr. Fox. So I argued, I got two federal felonies. One is forging and counterfeiting entry documents. The other one's diplomatic impersonation. And so I argued the, uh, uh, the both of them. But when I finished arguing the first one, the forging and counterfeiting entry documents, he just said, agreed. Case dismissed on that one. He said, on the other one, we're going to trial. This was just to save face. I had them beat on both. Okay, 
Now, the thing is that forging and counterfeiting entry documents arose because I made my own passport. Okay? Now, <laughs> you're getting a kick out of that one. Well, the thing is, it wasn't against the law. Now, if I made a United States passport, that would be different. But what I did was, I made a Kingdom of Israel passport, for, like from the Bible, not the Israel in the Middle East, but the one from the Bible, the Kingdom of Israel. Okay? There's no king over there. They have a parliament. They don't call it that. What do they call it? Neset or something. Anyway, uh, the the charge, and this is how it is, when you when they come against you, you've got to keep your wits about you. Okay, I was accused of forging and counterfeiting entry documents because I made a passport. But that statute, entry documents, that statute applies only to the Immigration and Naturalization Service and the documents they produce. And they produce immigrant visas, non-immigrant visas, student visas, uh, alien registration cards, border crossing cards, that stuff. Even housewives know that passports come from the State Department. But they accused me of something that was only and specifically limited to Immigration and naturalization, and they lost. So, you know, and the reality was, as far as I'm concerned, they couldn't win anyway because uh, I didn't do anything wrong. Now, if I'd made a French passport or a German passport, or an Italian passport, or a United States passport, that would be different. You know, but how are they going to have a complaining party? Is God going to complain? <laughs> I didn't hear that. You know, I dedicated my life. But I mean, I'm the firstborn, and 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 my parents are, are dead, and I, they, my parents died when I was 15, and you know, uh, I'm consecrated to His service. So, you know. It didn't seem unusual to me to make a Kingdom of Israel passport. You know? And, and uh, the only job you're offered in there is, the only position you're offered is as an ambassador to carry the good news of the gospel. And I went out and bought cases of Bibles, cases of concordances, printed up hundreds of photocopies of biblical law and everything else, went it out, and was promptly arrested by the Richardson police. <laughs> you know? And anyway, the published opinion in the case, oh, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself again. So, so we went to trial on the diplomatic impersonation. The government puts on their case. They got their witnesses and evidence and testimony and all that. And after they've done everything that they can, they say the government rests. And Barefoot Sanders says, well, Mr. Fox, you can put on your witnesses now. I said, no, I've already won. He said, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> that, that part there, when the government rests, whether it's a state case, and they say the state rests, or the federals, they say the government rests. When that, when that part of the trial happens, that's called a prima facie break. And what you can do is move the court to dismiss the whole thing if you've got some reasonable grounds, okay? Does and that, I had grounds. Does that mean a motion? Well, you could say that it means a motion. In their vernacular, they would call it a motion. It's called um, a motion for directed verdict or, you know, that kind of thing. But you can do it by affidavit and say directed verdict as presented by, you know, your name and by affidavit, you know. In any event, if you ever get to that position, you can also ask the court for time to produce your document to, to uh, you know, put it in writing what you need to do. And they might give you an hour or two break, or if it's, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon already, 
the judge might say, we're adjourned until tomorrow. We'll hear your motion for directed verdict at that time. Anyway, that's a time when you can win at the trial. And that's exactly what I did, and that's exactly what happened. Now, the interesting thing is, the, well, let me say this. That case is a published case in the federal law books from coast to coast. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I hit the front page of the Dallas newspaper in full color, the front page the next day. Uh, and in short order, the case was cited in the United States Code Annotated. And for the newbies, the United States Code is all the laws of the United States arranged into under 50 titles, like Title 8 is immigration, Title 26 is taxes, uh, Title 50 is war, Title 18 is criminal. Well, my case was cited under Title 18 because it was a criminal case, and they have the statute, and underneath the statute, they'll put two, three, four, five cases, just a sprinkle of the absolute landmark cases that have been litigated regarding that particular statute. And my case was right there. And that is the outer limits of the legal stratosphere. And you can call them, all the attorneys you want in Phoenix and ask how many cases they got cited in the United States Code Annotated. And you know, you hear them laugh because it's, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, you know, it's way out there, way out there. Yes. What statute was that? Okay, it was 18 USC 1546A. It is not there now. Oh. It was what they did. See, when I won that case, I mean, you can, you may be able to get it in the archives. And certainly if you, if you had your congressman or something that was serious enough interest to you, if you had your congressman check it out, uh, it's, it's, it happened, it's there, it was there. But what happened is, like, uh, what I was told happened anyway. The, a student from Notre Dame University of Law explained to me that that he studied my case and that what happened is my case opened the floodgates and all kinds of other people won their cases because of my case. And uh, one of the things was Paul Revere, the Kingdom of Heaven uh, Church in Sublimity, Oregon, they were issuing passports <laughs> and they cite my case as their cause for winning, you know, for doing the right thing, you know. And so Congress took such a butt kicking and all deal, they went ahead and changed the law. Well, that eliminated my case from those cited right under it, and they don't have to change the law substantially, just change a few words, and it's all of a sudden all new, and those cases get into the trash barrel. So that's basically what happened there. Uh, but there was, a, there was a, with the Southern Poverty Law Center, I don't know if you ever heard of them. Anyway, they uh, had a Professor Susskind, and he did up a thing, uh, they had a disc, and I guess maybe it was a book or something, Idiot Legal Arguments, and I was in there. And the guy never read the case because if he'd read it, he'd know that I won. <laughs> so how is it an idiot legal argument to win? He was talking about the court. <laughs> <laughs> Mark says he was talking about the court. Okay. So, um, Mr. Heitman, you, you had to, you wanted to say something about the email from, from, uh, what's his name, the attorney? Bob, Bob, Bob Oh, uh, 
It was the attorney, the uh, Tommy Cryer. Yeah, Tommy, Tommy Cryer. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say a word or two, or you? Know? I, I can, but you read it, so you might as well quote it if you want to. Oh, you can yeah. say a word or two about it. Okay. Well, if Susie knows about it, and a bunch of people know about it, and I don't know. Uh, I, you want to hear about that? Yes. Okay. So, so um, this attorney Tom Cryer in Louisiana wrote something about this seminar because he heard, got wind of it. And, first, first and of all, Tommy Cryer is considered by this group down there as one now one of the uh, experts at, that uh, we should all go out and get us an attorney because Tommy Cryer is now on the opposite side because he got the bar. They want to. They want to hear it all on the microphone. Okay. Start over. Well, this guy Robert Fox. He, you sure don't want to get him on your on your two because every morning he's going to have a list of junk like this. Okay, about seven or eight inches of anything that he might be sent. And I'm sure the man doesn't have time to read it all, but he sends it out, and he just absolutely polarizes your morning because it's going to take you all morning to just to sort out and get rid of it. <laughs> but uh, he's a guy that's collecting donations for his uh, bar association uh, honkies that want everybody to go to law school. And he's got a, he's got a scholarship deal going on. Well, that's Bob uh, Hurt. And one of the uh, Hot shots is this guy named uh, Tommy Cryer from uh, Shreveport, I believe, it was Louisiana, and uh, he, I believe, got disbarred, and he was out running around the country collecting money, for talking about how he should do this and how he should do that, and I wonder how he knows all this when he couldn't get himself off. <laughs> so, anyway, he just uh, heard about uh, Robert Fox got. Uh, 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 on the on this Bob Hurt uh, list, for some reason, I don't know who put it in there, but somebody put and it in. Susan put it in. in. Seminar. Susan put it in that there's going to be a seminar. Yeah. And and Bob Hurt put it out on the internet, and and then Tom, Tommy Cryer, the attorney, had to make his little had, had to put in his two cents. Had to put in his two cents, and he he said that uh, that I'm certifiable and. And that uh, uh, I was responsible for this problem. Uh, well, he said you were a certified lunatic in that time. <laughs> but anyway, the certified lunatic hasn't had a loss, and Tommy Carr hadn't had a win. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he's putting out this nonsense. And at first, you think the guy really knows what he's doing until you. You go over the whole thing and analyze the the document. You have to analyze it out paragraph by paragraph. And all it's doing is criticizing somebody to support this Bob Hurts junk. And it's just plain slanderous nonsense, my opinion, you know. That's what I look at it as. So I brought a copy of it for him to, to read on. I think he got a kick out of it, so pass it on to him. But uh, this kind of stuff can happen to anybody. It happens in courts all the time. I'm being called a Texas leg here because a guy, they had too many cases. And uh, I did, uh, I did do uh, uh, David Miller stuff. I don't know if y'all know what David Miller is, but David Miller is a correct sentence for communication syntax authority. Let go of the microphone, please. Let go of the microphone. Oh, oh, okay. He, David, David Miller is a, a metallurgical engineer, I'm a mining engineer, and I have a, a good relationship with him. I do understand now what he's doing, but I learned how to do it. I see nothing wrong with what he's doing. If the language is, is not correct, his argument is, if the language is not correct, how can the case be correct? That's a good philosophy, but they sure don't want to hear that because they can't win against it. Absolutely cannot win against it. Because if you don't express the language in the correct sentence structure and you're using the truth, and the truth lies in the government style of man, it's there. You have to have, in the truth language, you have to have two prepositional phrases. We don't use prepositional phrases. 
neither did Russia. Russia started back in the Russian language has, uh, and most languages have con uh, prepositional phrases in it because a prepositional phrase has to have two nouns. And it has to have one meaning. It has to be able to be read frontwards and backwards and mean the same thing. And it has to have at no less than 13 words. Now you try to put that together and use the language that we got and you you have to just forget about the dictionary that has all the D words in it because DE is a negative term. There isn't one word under D that starts with DE. It's not a negative phrase. It's a negative phrase, it's not true. You see? So that was his argument. But he didn't like that. So he they shoved this thing up to a guy named Quackenbush. He has the right name. He's a federal judge up in Spokane. He's got the right name. Well, judge Quackenbush immediately called me a vexing litigator. I don't know where he got his facts from, but I'm going to find out next time I go to court because now the attorney picks it up. Cook first. The state judge picked up that I'm I'm a kook. I'm a Everything was gobbledygook and everything was gibberish because I was using this. And he found against me for all these various things. And three of them did that. And I've been through four uh, state judges, none in federal court. But anyway, the, the uh, thing that they're coming up with now is that the chief federal judge of the state of Idaho is now calling me a vexing litigator. Where did he get it from? He got it from the attorney. And the attorney got it from who? He got it from Quackenbush. And, and I said, where? On the record. Do you find any competent fact testimony that allows you to call me anything? And that hasn't gotten to court, but it's right here in the document I'm going to put on the court. And I, I expect to get a, a big kick out of that one because there's nothing they can do about it. Absolutely, because they have no fact witness testimony. Another thing about affidavits that I happen to learn about is an affidavit is worthless unless you testify to it. Or you qualify it, like you said. You qualify it, you must answer in 30 days. You now have sent them an offer to contract. If you have an offer to contract and they don't respond, think well, they're dead. But if you just send an affidavit in, any kind of affidavit, you can make the affidavit. But if you don't testify to that affidavit, and I experienced this in this case, because I have two engineers, and being an engineer, I have no trouble knowing this because I developed lots of subdivisions. And a subdivision cannot have more than one protective covenant on it. If it does have more, then it's ludicrous. You know, it's ambiguous. You're sitting here with one that says, you got to have 50% rocks in the front of your yard. This one over here says you got to have 90% grass. And you can't have 50% rocks and have 90% grass. So this guy over here gets one set, and this guy gets another set, and now they have a war. They can't have that. So in, a, in, in, in the county commission, when they put their stamps on the subdivision plat, and they got a whole bunch of little stamps below around them, they, they certify that they have covenants on that. There's only one set. And in my case, that one set is neither one of the kind they put in. They put two sets in. So that's another argument. But uh, to come back down, is if this guy puts in two sets of covenants, wouldn't you suspect that that's a fraud on the court if he brings his case for that? It certainly is fraud on the court. I mean, a, a fraudulent act, a misrepresentation of material facts, is it not? Okay. And that's where, that's where we're going. But Tommy Cryer, if you read this document and the letters, he's got it right. I just made a copy for his benefit. It, you have to look at it and analyze it, and you see it's just a bunch of slander. And why these people want to do this, and why they want to promote uh, attorneys, is beyond me. Because a man, an attorney is a man who likes to make a living by his wit. And, and if, he, if, if, that, if you believe that, then he has to be a liar, cheat, and sneak. He can't be anything else but. That's my Okay, thank you. So, uh, <coughs> you made a statement that an affidavit is not any good unless you testify to it. 
Okay, it's what I was explaining earlier. All affidavits are hearsay until they're testified to. I understand that. Okay, now the thing is that what I do to them, like I have my own script, like I was explaining. Right. I'm standing up to accurately state the fact the facts and may subject myself to penalties for perjury under the laws of the United States of America. Having qualified my testimony here today, I hereby state for the record, and I go into my stuff. Now, if I've got a bunch of affidavits on the record, I declare that all the affidavits I've filed in this case are true, correct, and accurate. Now, I've testified to all of it. That's a separate action. Uh, that, that no, works. no, I think I think you're a bit confused. I am. What, <coughs> yeah, if you put in an affidavit and you state these are the facts, yeah. okay, and, and at the beginning of the affidavit you say you're okay. over 18, you're qualified to testify, you uh, if called upon, you must have that in. If called upon to testify, I agree, I will testify. And uh, there's a couple others. Oh, we're coming to the end of the. Did we're finished? Yeah, it's break time. You just. Uh, Yeah, break time. Break time. <laughs> we're going to have vegetables for about 10, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we've got some uh, vegetable trays out here, some drinks, coffee, whatever you like. So go to the bathroom, take a break. At, at the end of the thing, he qualifies just by saying, if you don't respond in 30 days, you agree to what I said. Okay, got that. Right. That makes a difference. Is that what you call testimony? No. no. Testimony is stated. I'll go back. The testimony is verbal in the court under oath. Robert, but I make my own assignment. Just so you know, we're all clear about this. The 30 days, is that a statutory requirement automatically that you have to respond within 30 days or it's gone? Or do you have to put it in the end of the day? Because that's what I think he's saying. It has to be incorporated in. Okay, you can you can put whatever you want in there in a criminal quiet place. If we are we still on the record? Yes, we're trying to be. We're trying to be. Huh? We're trying to be. Okay. Well, the question was about it was thirty days, and the answer is motion practice in a criminal case is ten days. Motion practice in the state uh, in a civil case is 20 days, summary judgment is 21 days, common law is 30. If you've got 30 days and don't answer in 30 days, you're toast at the common law, okay? And that's where it is. And that, so even though, even I might be in a situation where I really desperately need them to answer within 10 days, say trial is gonna start in 10 days, I nevertheless put 30 days there. Reason being, even if they were to convict me at trial, if they don't answer the affidavit by 30 days, they are finished anyway. So the trial has to be, you know, reversed because, you know, they didn't they didn't do the right thing. Yeah, I think the question was, is there a statutory law that says 30 days it becomes out? It's a matter cases. No. It's a matter of contract. Okay. You offered him a contract. That's why he's doing the 30 days, so he creates a contract. Because it's not statutorily. Okay. That's what the banks do. Right. right. That's why. He's, 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 adding, he's adding punching power. There is That's case law. Case law that you and it's has Morris versus yeah. National Cash, Cash Register and, and other cases. You know, 30 days and an affidavit on the record for 30 days becomes fact. It's just like you said, if you don't respond in 30 days, you owe me a, a, a $500. If you don't respond in that 30 days, I don't care what it is, you agree to that $500 and you've got to pay it. That's, just, that's, exactly, that's exactly what it is. It's the same thing. Anytime somebody sends you a document, this is called the, the uh, commercial affidavit process, by the way. And if somebody sends you something that, and requires you to respond, you have an obligation to respond to that document. If you don't respond to that document, you're hooked. Well, not necessarily. You don't even have to go to court. You're hooked. Not necessarily. You're, you've got an uphill battle to beat it. We're, we're giving legal advice now, see? That's not necessarily true. 
We'll, we'll go over it. Yeah, okay. Thank you.